Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm very excited to be here with a distinguished global leader, Mr. Carlos Gom. And today, uh, the as a, as a moderator said that the, we are talking about new technology uh, with uh, Mr. Gom, autonomous uh, driving uh, technology. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Gom Gon san Welcome. Yeah. Uh, you know, as we have only 30 minutes, let's go uh, with the question. Okay, uh, and I think, uh, you know, first uh, my question to you should be a very basic question. I want to learn about uh, how much you are uh, excited about uh, this new technology. So tell, tell us uh, what you, you're thinking, what the benefit uh, of uh, new, this uh, new uh, autonomous uh, driving te technology. Well, as, as you know, the, the car industry is, is still a very important industry, and the product is moving a lot toward the future. And the main characteristic of the change is electrification of the cars, connectivity of the cars, mm -hmm. and autonomy of the car. So specifically on autonomous drive, uh, this is going to happen. Uh, this is happening and is going to happen for a lot of reasons. Uh, the most important one is the fact that it brings a lot of concrete benefits to society and to individuals. First to society because cars which are autonomous are safer. 90% mm -hmm. of accidents on the road are due to human error or mm -hmm. mistakes. So the more you reduce human interface with the machine, the more you reduce the cause of accidents. Mm -hmm. So this is the first and most important reason for which, by the way, autonomous drive and everything going in autonomous drive is supported by many governments who are going to facilitate regulation. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Second, autonomous drive is going to make driving more pleasant mm -hmm. because a lot of people spend a lot of time every day in traffic jams. Mm -hmm. Traffic jams on highway, traffic jam in city driving. And the more you move to autonomous drive, you're going to allow the car to drive you so you're going to be able to do something else. So it's more pleasant and it's more productive. Mm -hmm. Uh, third, you know, we're going towards aging population. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the population uh, in 2030, statistics show that more than one third of the population will be more than 65 years old. Okay. So, uh, and you know that with age, the ability to drive and to be attentive diminish. And it's going to be very difficult for people who have been driving all their life, who have their autonomy, to abandon right. the driving. So autonomy, autonomous drive is going to allow people, particularly older people, to continue to benefit from the autonomous transportation. These are some of the reasons for which I consider this technology is absolutely uh, essential and is going to drive all car makers towards it. So you, thank you. Uh, so you touch on uh, the uh, benefit for uh, aging population. As you know, the Japan is uh, known as a uh, fast grow, fast aging. Uh, country. So tell us about what, uh, uh, what will be the benefit, particularly for Japan. Yeah. Well, uh, obviously, that means if I take the case of Japan, where, as you know, Japan is the country with, the, I think, the highest uh, life expectancy, mm -hmm. which is today more than 82 years old. Uh, but a lot of people consider that people who are born today, most of them are, live more than 100 years. So. We need to prepare the technology allowing autonomous transportation to carry these people during all their life, which obviously is going to allow you to drive younger with autonomous drive and older because of all its benefit. Mm -hmm. The benefit for Japan, as you know today, is uh, the government particularly is extremely worried about um, a lot of accidents happening to older drivers. Right. Okay? And, and we, with the autonomous drive, are going to help a lot reduce this level of accident. Mm -hmm. Second, you know that a lot of people living outside the cities, because people living in the cities, they have many options. If they don't have a car, they cannot drive, they have taxis, they have metro, they have many things. But people living in the countryside, mm -hmm. often the car is the only way mm -hmm. they, can, they can move. And particularly for older people, it becomes something absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. So I think for Japan, not only a lot of people still live in the countryside, but on top of this, you have Older, older people, this technology is absolutely essential. Mm. Thank you, thank you. You, you touch on a little bit about uh, like, uh, you know, how uh, the, uh, this technology would change the, our life. But uh, tell us more about like, uh, landscape, uh, landscape 
of, uh, of the new world with this technology. Like, uh, for example, like uh, designing of urban and countryside, or what uh, will public transportation to be, or like a trend of owning, owning, owning car, or using share, sharing car. Well, how uh, the world change? Yeah, well, there is a lot of change taking place. First, autonomous drive is going to come by waves. It's not going to come all of a sudden, one day, you're going to have a fully autonomous car. It's coming by wave. And in fact, it started in Japan. It started in Japan. Uh, if today you go and buy a Serena from Nissan, you have highway, one lane, autonomous drive. It's a functionality which is already in the car. That's the first step. It's already on the market. In two years, in 2018, you're going to have highway, multi-lane, autonomous drive. Which means okay. that when you are on a highway, you put it on transportation mode, on autonomous mode, and the car is going to drive you. Uh, by next year? 2018. Okay. Okay. Then 2020, 21, you're going to have city driving autonomous drive. Mm -hmm. City driving, but in normal condition. Then 2022, 2023, you're going to have all conditions city driving, and at the same time, you're going to have what we call the robo-taxi. Robo-taxi is car without a driver, uh -huh. okay? Autonomous drive, the driver is still in the car. Robo-taxi, there is no more driver in the, in the car, see. and you know, this is something which is of a lot of interest for many companies like Uber or Lyft. All these companies of transportation are extremely interested into having cars that can drive without a, a driver. Mm -hmm. So we are pursuing the two avenues the autonomous drive from one side and the robotaxi from the other side. Now, there is a lot of questions about, yeah, but with all this technology, do people want to continue to own a car? Is this not going to be substituting the normal behavior? Right. I don't think so. I think you're going to have two markets. You're going to have the market of owning a car, and this is the market which today represents maybe 99% of the, of the global market, mm -hmm. but which still represents maybe 70 or 80% of the mm -hmm. global market, because the car is more than a rational decision. The car also has some kind of emotional decision for the family, for the individual, and this is gonna continue. Now, mm -hmm. beside this, you're gonna have shared cars, shared services, a lot of new ways of using cars that are gonna develop on top of mm -hmm. the, classical, the classical market. So we don't see shared cars, shared services as a substitution, we see it as an addition to the normal market. Okay, that's 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 good now because uh, I'm uh, you know I like a driving lot, so you know I have a three car, but sorry, not uh, not Renaults, but that's the you know I still wanna uh, uh, enjoy driving. So, yeah. uh, but let's sit to uh, to the next question. I like you know I, I now we understand that uh, your what kind of landscape you are thinking about. Now, next question might be. How it can be happened? How you know, technology uh, uh, will be evolving, and how uh, that will be rolled out? Yeah. Well, obviously, this technology, particularly about autonomous car and connected cars, is going to require a lot of new devices. There are a lot. All of this is possible because you have new computing power, you have new cameras, you have new sensors. You have, new that in, you have plenty of technology which make the autonomous car possible. This was not possible five years ago. Uh, you know, the evolution of the cameras, the evolution of the mapping, the evolution of the sensors make this technology possible. So, and, and that's why we are very prudent to the pace at which it's going to happen because our pace of evolution depends also on the pace of the evolution of the computing power into, in, in, into the car. So we depend a lot on Intel. We, de we, de uh, we depend on a lot of companies, for example, who are uh, uh, providing the ships and providing the, the computers inside, inside the car. But with the evolution they are telling us, we know that in two, three years, we're going to be there. On top of this, the, the evolution of the cameras, the sensors, the radars, extremely important for us. Plus the evolution of you know, artificial intelligence. Um, if, and, and that's why we have to partner with a lot of companies right. in order to make this happen. The car makers have always been architects. We are architects. We assemble parts. Right. We assemble technologies. We assemble people in order to bring this product. So from time to time, we decide to develop the technology by ourselves. From time to time, we decide to buy the technology from somebody else. If you look today, one car is made in average of 3,000 parts. 
You need 3,000 parts to make a car. We don't produce all these parts. A lot of these parts are coming from suppliers from all over the world. Uh, we have parts coming from India, from China, from Japan, no matter where you are assembling the car. So we, we, we are here to make sure that the technology is available, whatever we do it or somebody else do it. We are here to make sure that the parts are available, whatever we do it or somebody else do it. But our role is to assemble them into a product which is, which is competitive. That's why in technology, you're seeing us partnering with a lot. For example, for connectivity, we have Microsoft as a partner to develop the connectivity of the car. Uh, for autonomous drive, we have many, many partners. You know, we're partnering for cameras with some people, uh, for chips with some other people. So this partnership is going to continue and develop, and it's changing a little bit our role, because obviously we're going to need more software, we need more computer scientists inside the company compared to the kind of engineers we had in the past. So that means that the, uh, you know, um, many automakers are really excited about, or, uh, you know, rushed into this space. Not only car makers, but also uh, some of tech companies, like including, including Google or others, yeah. right? And so you do not, uh, you do not necessarily compete with them, but more like for alliance with yeah. them? Yeah. Is that no, I mean, yeah, I know that the media loves uh, to talk about, you know, car makers are going to disappear, and now you have a new breed of people coming, etc. and Apple and Google. I mean, these guys are not interested into the car industry. We, we, we know that. And there are objective reasons for which they are not interested. They are not interested because fundamentally they make more money than the car makers. Okay? So nobody diversify moving into an area where you have less return on your investments. Usually it's the other way around. We should move to tech company, but tech company moving to car maker doesn't make sense. That's number one. But they need the car maker because they know that the car is going to be the next important object in the life of people on earth where they need to bring their technology and particularly put their applications. Uh, you know, after the telephone, which frankly started as a telephone and now is a personal device where you not only call, but you have your email, you can see video, you can see TVs, you can see a lot of things. So the telephone started as a telephone, but now it becomes a kind of personal device where you do a lot of things. Well, the car is going to do the same thing. The car used to be a transportation device. Just, you know, you go from place A to place B. But what we are seeing in the future is going to become a mobile space where you can work and where you can have leisure. You can see movie, you can have video, you can video conference. And on top of this, you can transport yourself. <clears throat> this is where we're going. And this is very exciting for tech companies, not to become car makers, but to participate to make this transformation with the car makers. Thank you. And also, uh, you a little bit touched on that the, uh, how alliance is important, right? And because uh, you have to deal with uh, so many parts and so many ideas. Today, this is slash, right? And most of uh, there are so, so many startups coming and ventures yeah. coming. How do you want to work with them? How do you attract, uh, attract, attract to them? Well, uh, you know, obviously, usually startups come to us because they have something to sell. They have a technology, they have a device, they have a part, they have an innovation, so they come, they come to us. And our big challenge is how can we deal with startups, how we understand startup, and how we decide that we want to collaborate with the startups, and particularly how, we can, how can we collaborate. Because there are many ways of collaboration. The first collaboration is to become a customer of the startup. Uh, startup come with the technology, we're interested in the technology, we say, okay, let's make a contract, we buy this technology from you or we buy this device from you. That's the easiest one. Then you have investment into startup. You take a percentage of startup and you allow the startup to continue to develop and you're a, a partner of the startup. And then in some cases we buy the startups. You know, some startup are saying, okay, I reached a level above which I need a larger company uh, to, take, to take the lead. So we have different ways to work with the startup, and we welcome them, particularly in the technology we are interested in, because we know that we have to be very open to disruptions coming from the world of startup, mm -hmm. particularly that artificial intelligence is going to transform all the objects which are surrounding us, mm -hmm. and the car is one of the most important. So mm -hmm. 
I'm not saying it's easy for us because we're a large organization. Uh, startups are usually small and they are nimble and they are agile and people do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But we have to learn how to work and we are learning how to work with the startup in different modes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, thank you. And, uh, you know, uh, we just, uh, I have just asked that how to alliance with, uh, uh, with startups. But on the other hand, you know, that in these days there are some trends that uh, uh, the people more, uh, you know, uh, tr uh, try to uh, try to work with uh, uh, with the startups or ventures rather than working within a large company. As a, you know, one of the CEO of uh, the large company, how do you attract them? You know, not to uh, yeah. you know, uh, them to leave. No, it's it's. A, I mean, obviously for us, it's a le it's a real issue about how to be attractive for young people. Because most of young people today are more attracted for small entities, small company startups, which is fair. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I, I have young uh, kids and they're all, practically all of them are in startups because they just don't want to join large, large company. So three of them are yeah, all. Yeah, right? three of, of the four are in startups. So I'm dealing with this all the time and absorbing, uh, ab observing what is interesting for them and not. Uh, Large companies have some advantages also uh, compared to startup. I don't think we can compete with startup whenever people are passionate about something specific and they want to own a company and they want, we cannot compete. But in some cases, as you know, nine of, out of 10 startup don't make it. Okay, nine of 10. Today the statistics is you have 10%, 10% yeah. success in startup. So you still have a lot of people who, after a while working in a startup, find themselves without a job. So they can go for another startup, or eventually they can settle down after this experience and join a company. So we are appealing to some of these people, uh, obviously the most successful. Second, uh, the way you work in a startup is very different than the way you work in a large company. In a startup, I mean, I can see it, people work day and night. There is no vacation, there is, you do everything in a startup, you serve the coffee, you are the CEO, you go see the customer, you develop technology, and, and, and people get a lot of very small revenue at the beginning. Uh, I mean, they're gonna have to wait until they really make it in order to have some income. Right. Obviously, in large company, things are a little bit more stable. Mm -hmm. So there are different worlds right. for different people, and what we're trying to do is not to compete against startup, because we know we cannot, but to attract the people who, after an experience in startup, may be interested right. into joining a large company, or eventually when we buy startup, because it happens, because we need a lot of computer scientists and um, uh, you know people specialized in certain sector, we buy startup for the talent of the startup, and we maintain autonomy of the startup inside the organization. This is another way to have these people join us. Thank you. And before we move to your uh, you know, experience or as a CEO. Uh, as a last uh, question about technology of a car maker, I, I, I mean, uh, uh, autonomous uh, um, uh, technology. Yeah. EV, right? The uh, electric vehicles. That's, I, I think Nissan is uh, probably the first uh, you know, uh, car maker that's the, to launch the fully, fully uh, uh, EV in Japan. Um, that was the five years ago, six, or oh, seven years ago, right? Yeah, this was about, yeah, eight years, uh, seven years ago. Right. At that time, not so many people believed that the EV is, uh, can be uh, you know, successful. Exactly. But how do you think that now? Do you think, uh, at that time, what, uh, what, what were you thinking? What, and yeah. what, what are you thinking now? Yeah, let me tell you something. I mean, if you want to innovate, you have to be ready to bring an idea that nobody believes in. Okay, I mean, if, if, if everybody believes in the idea, you're not gonna innovate, somebody else is gonna right. do it. So, whenever you bring an innovation, you're gonna be surrounded by skeptical people who are gonna say, well, this is never gonna work. Every innovator start with this. Mm -hmm. But then, the innovator who make it are the people who have the stamina and the resistance and the continuity to continue with their idea, even though they are surrounded by many critics and many skepticism. Mm -hmm. If not, there is no way an innovation is gonna happen. So, when we started with the electric car in 2010, a lot of skepticism, which by the way, is not finished yet, even today, okay. with all the evidence, with all the evidence, still people are skeptic. 
But our reasoning is very simple. Usually innovation always starts with very re simple reasoning. If your reasoning is very complicated, it's not going to work. The reasoning is that our industry, which consists in producing and selling every year more than 90 million cars in the world, mm -hmm. every day on the planet, there is more than 1 billion, 1 billion cars being driven on the planet and this is increasing, there is no future. There is absolutely no future for our industry and for human transportation without zero emission. I mean, it's a very simple calculation of potential. And, and I'm telling you this knowing that with 90 million cars sold every year now and one billion car being driven every year in China, in India, in Brazil, in Africa, the level of motorization is very low. It's very low. Mm -hmm. In the United States, you have practically one car for one person. In India, you have one car for 100 people. Really? Huh. Nobody's, nobody thinks one moment that India is going to stay see. with one car for 100 people. Yeah. This is going to move to two cars per one, uh, T, five, ten, etc. And this means a huge potential of development. This is not going to happen with emissions as they are today. So the electric car and the zero emission car are part of the future of transportation of human beings. So we have the solution, so we need to put it on the market. Very simple. And what we're seeing today is that it's not the consumer who's driving the electric cars. It's government who are driving electric cars by putting emission regulation, which are stiffer and stiffer, which putting the car maker in a situation that they cannot reach these levels unless they bring electric car or zero emission cars on the market. So. And again, don't, don't think you're going to innovate with unanimity and consensus around you. That doesn't exist. Innovation comes always through difficulty, hardship, criticism, skepticism. And you have to have the strength to carry it beyond and against all of this. Electric car is one example. Thank you. So we have uh, five minutes uh, uh, um, left. And I want to move to uh, your um, you know, showing your experience as a global CEO, okay? The, you, your alliance uh, between uh, Nissan and Luno, I had uh, just turned out uh, 18 years old, right? Yeah. And uh, when Luno sent you uh, to, 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 uh, to Japan, not so many people believe that the French, Japanese companies can work, right? What, what, what was the uh, key to success to make it happen from your experience? Yeah. Well, usually, you know, obviously I'm, I'm in front of uh, a lot of entrepreneurs or, or future entrepreneurs. I mean, usually when people don't believe something's going to happen, this is where the breakthrough are possible. Okay. Okay. So people saw, said, yeah, I mean, first people did not believe that we could revive Nissan. In 1999, a lot of people considered that Nissan was a doomed company. It cannot be revived. It went through two reviver plan, all of them were unsuccessful. And a lot of people said, you know, this is going to be another failed tentative. On top of this with foreign year, it's going to be very complicated. Uh, then the Renault Nissan, how French and Japanese together, working together can do a better job than French alone or Japanese alone. Well, in a certain way, I, I believe, I believe the fact that diversity is a strength. Mm -hmm. Diversity is a strength. Diversity is more difficult but at the same time, it's a strength because with diverse people, people with Japanese culture, working with American people, with Chinese, with Koreans, with French, with German, it's much more difficult. But at the same time, they can be much more creative because they go beyond the obvious. They go beyond their habits and traditions. And that's exactly what happened with the lines. A lot of people, when we started working together, they said, this is not gonna, this is not gonna work. Mm -hmm. 18 years later, not only we are there, Renault and Nissan still a very solid alliance, but also we had many companies joining. Now we have Mitsubishi joining the alliance, okay? And what is very important is how company which have been struggling alone, Nissan was struggling alone, Renault was struggling alone, Mitsubishi was struggling alone. When they come and work together, well, it's much stronger. It's much more stable. It's much more stable. So obviously, alliances are difficult to manage. They are difficult to make work. 
But at the same time, when they work, they are much more powerful. And obviously, you're not going to convince people by telling them, yeah, this works or this doesn't work. You have to show them. And what is good in companies is you can show that with very simple indicator. Growth, profits, cash flow. This is the way you indicate how something works and something doesn't, uh, doesn't work. Today, Renault Nissan Alliance with Mitsubishi represents 10 million cars. And today, we are objectively in the top three global automaker. But what is the most important is our trend right. is much higher than the other car makers. And this is coming from the diversity mm -hmm. of the association. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think uh, this might be last uh, question to you, as uh, we have only two minutes. Uh, and you have been described as a prototypical global CEO, right? In these days, uh, being a successful CEO, it has to be global. And today, there are so many uh, uh, future CEO. Please give them uh, like tips to be successful uh, global, uh, uh, global CEO. What uh, they are thinking about? What, well, what they should uh, think well, about? Well, I, I know that today there is a lot of uh, hesitation about globalization. A lot of people, yeah, there is more protectionism. People are much more trying to reestablish borders, etc. Frankly, I, I don't think this is going to stay. I don't think it's going to stay. Uh, you know, in the trends in human life, you have trends, and from time to time, you have corrections. What we are seeing today is correction. We have correction for some excesses. But the trend towards globalization is going to continue because younger people do not want to limit themselves to the horizon of their own country. They are, by definition, global. They are global through the net. They are global through travel. They are global through knowledge, through education, through many things. So my advice is don't limit yourself to short-term evolution. Look at the big picture and look at the fundamental trends. And the fundamental trend is barriers are going to fall. The world is one village. And we're going to continue to work with one market with some difficulty, but, but one market. That's number one. And second, what makes a CEO at the end of the day is its performance. You know, just make sure that you are concentrating on your performance, whatever the performance is expected from you. You know, in the case of startup, performance is mainly on growth of the company and then eventually on the profitability of the company. Stick to it. The fundamentals may not be flashy on the short term, but on the midterm and on the long term, that's the only thing which matters. You know, look at the long term trend, stick to the performance which is meaningful, and be patient because at the end of the day, if you're doing well, it will show up. Thank you, thank you very much. Now I think we, our time is up. You know that uh, Gonsan is coming uh, uh, to Japan for attending this event only. Please give him a, your best uh, hugs. Thank you. Thank yeah, you thank very much, Gonsan.